Well, let me wish a good post-Thanksgiving morning to everyone in the United States. I hope you've all recovered from, uh, from the indulgences of the holiday, and uh, we're really delighted to have you with us uh, on this Monday morning uh, after, uh, after such a big holiday. Uh, I'm Jeff Rafke. Uh, I'm the president of the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies at Johns Hopkins University, and we are really delighted to welcome uh, participants and viewers from uh, uh, across the United States, from uh, Europe and around the world to this uh, seminar uh, today. Uh, this is a topic that really couldn't be more timely. Structural economic change and climate policy uh, and its effect uh, on the traditional fossil fuels industry is one that is at the top of the agenda in Germany and in the United States. Uh, and so uh, if we look at the United States the infrastructure bill that was passed just recently, uh, which promotes renewable energy, as well as the, uh, the bill that is still in Congress uh, for, for further spending, uh, which will impact climate policy. Or if we look at Germany, where a new coalition is poised to take office as early as next week, perhaps, which will include among its ambitions, not only the expansion of renewable energy, but also the accelerated end to coal generated electricity. Um, and so with all of this uh, happening around us, this, uh, there could no, be no better time than to hear from Thomas Froehlich about the results of his research into the coal transition in the United States and Germany. I'm going to pass the microphone now uh, to my colleague, uh, Liz Hoteri, uh, who is going to moderate uh, our discussion. And uh, so Liz, over to you, and uh, we look forward to getting started. Thanks, Jeff. Um, a reminder to the audience before I introduce Thomas, um, we'll be taking your questions from the Q&A function. Um, so you can ask those questions anytime throughout Thomas's presentation. Um, and now I'd like to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Thomas Frolisch is a DAAD AICGS Research Fellow um, at AICGS. And he currently holds an ESRC postdoctoral fellowship at the Department of War Studies at King's College London. And his research examines the intersection between climate change mitigation, global deployment of low carbon energy, geopolitics, and international relations theory. And his PhD analyzed Brazil's international ethanol strategy and its attempts to create a, a global market for biofuels. And he has a forthcoming book on this same topic. So Thomas, we're so pleased to have you um, speak to us today and I hand the microphone over to you. Great, <clears throat> can you hear me well? Yeah, cool, thanks. Um, thank you, Jeff and Liz for this kind introduction. Um, I've been here at AICGS since the end of August, and um, today it's my turn to present what, what I have been doing, um, what I found, and what my recommendations are for uh, policymakers and maybe other researchers who want to dive deeper into the topic. But before I start, I would like to thank uh, the DRD for, for the funding that was provided here, uh, the, the team at AICGS who welcomed me um, into their family, I, I'm tempted to say, in particular Jeff, uh, Susanne, Eric, and Liz, who helped um, with logistics, but also with a lot of uh, contacts and uh, ideas how to how to conduct my research. And I also want to uh, give a special thanks to to my colleagues and bosses at uh, KCL, um, Mike Goodman and Vinicius de Cavallo, who were really supportive of me applying and uh, coming here to AICGS. Um, as uh, Liz already mentioned, I am a political scientist, um, I study political science, but then did my PhD in international relations with a focus on climate change mitigation and energy security. Um, the, the topic that I'm on my research project here goes back to uh, comparative political science, but um, I will tell you soon um, why I think that is still uh, relevant for international relations. So what is the problem that I have been looking at? The big problem is that uh, coal is a major polluter and phasing out coal is surprisingly hard or maybe not so surprising. And um, I, I in, this, in this spirit of uh, the, the COP conferences and um, 
also the the German energy vendor. Um, I, I was really interested in the question: um, what what makes people in coal regions resist uh, that change? And as I said, I have been here in DC to prepare a comparative case study between Eastern Germany and in particular the lignite mining region of Lusatia and Appalachia and in particular West Virginia. Um, my initial idea was to, to compare these like two bigger regions, but then on the ground here in the US, I, I discovered that it would be prudent to focus on, on the singular state of West Virginia for the time being. Um, maybe, maybe I can come back and do further field work in, in neighboring states. So what did I do? Um, I arrived here at the end of August and uh, dove right into uh, contacting uh, people in the US and in West Virginia who are um, involved in, in managing this, this transition. And I, I talked to about 30 um, experts and decision makers uh, in the form of semi-structured um, interviews. Um, I talked also to, to policymakers and activists and, uh, and entrepreneurs in, in West Virginia. Um, my field work not only included these like very you know, semi-structured interviews, but also uh, the observation of local initiatives and really understanding um, how, how things work on the ground. Um, so wh why did I choose these two regions? I, I think on, in, in academic terms, there are really neat case studies, at least initially I thought that. And both, both regions are undergoing transitions from coal dependency to new economic structures. Um, the, the commonalities uh, include, well, what I just said, that they used to be coal dependent and very industry heavy. And this dependence already has been fading. So um, unlike con common, uh, common belief might suggest, um, the, the dependence on coal in these regions has already been reducing at least since the 1980s. It is not um, in in both cases, a pure decision on, on climate change. Um, furthermore, both regions have lower development indicators in their regional context. If you, if you look at Eastern Germany, there's higher unemployment, there's uh, lower levels of education, and the same accounts for West Virginia um, as, as the American uh, attendees will, will know. And politically speaking, both regions are also really interesting because they experienced uh, political swings to the extreme uh, right of the political spectrum after long periods of centrist or, or center-left uh, politics. Interestingly, also in a political science case study or for a political case study is that both regions uh, span across multiple states. In the case of Lusatia, it's the, the states or lender of Brandenburg um, and, and Sachsen. And uh, Appalachia uh, spans from the southwest of Pennsylvania all the way down to, to Kentucky and Tennessee. And uh, finally, uh, an interesting commonality that I, I tried to dive into deeper as well um, is that there are um, regional development organizations that include uh, multi-level actors. So in Germany, um, there, there is the regional development uh, organization for Lusatia, but then also the whole process around the, the Kohle Commission, the, the organization that negotiated the, the phase out of coal in Eastern Germany. And in Appalachia, you have the Appalachian Regional Commission, which um, is an organization that includes every level from, from the local level uh, through the state level to the federal level in the US. That being said, the two cases look pretty neat and comparable, a uh, most similar case study, but I think we also have to recognize the stark differences between um, the, two, the two regions. On the one hand, the question, what is being mined? So in Lusatia, we 
talk mainly about lignite mining, which is in German Braunkohle, um, brown coal, uh, which is uh, le less energy dense and a, a bit more dirty um, than, than anthracite uh, or Steinkohle in German. Um, and the mining in Lusatia has been for, for a long time been open cast mining. Uh, so you, you dig a big hole uh, that, is, that spans across several square kilometers and um, yeah, move the coal. It is different than in traditionally in West Virginia where um, hard coal anthracite was mined um, initially through uh, deep cast mining. So the, the typical um, mine that comes to mind where, where miners go into the mountain and extract the, the resource for, resources from, from the mountain. Later on from the 1980s, um, mountaintop removal uh, became uh, the standard practice in West Virginia. And as the name suggests, uh, it is a type of open cast mining and it works in the way that literally at the top of a mountain um, is removed and uh, that um, exposes the anthracite um, deposits. Another very important um, difference is, um, is that West Virginia has a significantly lower level of development uh, compared to um, Eastern Germany, but also within the US. Um, that extends to from education over uh, road infrastructure to internet access. Um, one one uh, statistic that I find very interesting and relevant in this context is that West Virginia's literacy rate um, is around 87%, uh, which uh, puts West Virginia at a level roughly between Zimbabwe or Syria. Um, so, so I think it, it's important to recognize that, that the level of, or the, the effort for development is, or the need for development is, is much larger in West Virginia than in Eastern Germany. Um, equally, West Virginia uh, is, is a beautiful state, um, but, that comes with a difficult terrain. Uh, you have mountains that make it really uh, difficult or expensive at least to, to build infrastructure, uh, which also in a not so densely populated state with less than 2 million inhabitants um, increases the, the cost for infrastructure. And then the final crucial difference um, in the two cases is that in West Virginia, the decision or the process uh, to phase out coal is predominantly market-based. So coal has, been coming, uh, has become too expensive um, to be competitive in the international market. And uh, that initially led to the dying of deep, deep cast mines um, and uh, a preference uh, for mountaintop removal. And later on in the 2010s, um, coal was to a large degree replaced by uh, fracking technology and natural gas production. Whereas on the other hand, in Germany, the process, especially in Eastern Germany, is politically driven. It is clear uh, there was a decision already starting in 2015 that uh, Germany would phase out the, the use of coal. And then with the Kohle Commission, um, this political decision um, has been turned into reality. So let me briefly describe what happened in both cases. To start with Lusatia, um, after World War II and the GDR, Lusatia became uh, one of the most important uh, energy regions in the GDR. And um, the, the mines of Lus Lusatia fueled um, a lot of the industry in the GDR. Um, post 1990 already, um, first of all, the, the industry uh, decreased a lot, it died out in former Eastern Germany, and therefore the, the demand for the local coal um, also decreased, but production continued. Um, and uh, as I already said, um, the, the zeitgeist in Germany already in the late 1990s uh, changed towards a more green and uh, climate-focused mindset and the, the initial ideas to, 
to phase out coal uh, with the energy vendor were discussed on, or how to manage it was discussed in 2015 and in 2018 to 2020 the Kohle Commission um, produced their report uh, how to best um, phase out coal. It is very important I think to to recognize that the Kohle Commission, with all its shortcomings, was a participatory process. There were representatives of, uh, of, of politics, uh, experts from academia, um, the, the owners of the coal mines, uh, the operators of the coal power plants, uh, but also um, local uh, groups were represented and um, and uh, climate uh, climate ex experts and activists. Um, the compromise that resulted in the COLA, from the COLA Commission is that uh, Germany will phase out coal by 2035. The new coalition agreement um, says ideally already by 2030. And it will be interesting to see how, how the new government will speed up the process. Um, the compromise includes very generous compensation schemes for operators um, and includes uh, renaturation efforts and uh, development efforts. In short, we can already identify a few successes, um, namely industry clusters um, that, that have been um, installed near former uh, coal um, power plants or production sites. Um, an investment in higher education, especially around the city of Cottbus and um, the big first step after uh, open cast uh, mines are being closed and renaturated uh, is the tourism sector that is growing in that region. But also there are some failures. Uh, the plans uh, fall short of a truly just transition and have led to, to political disenfranchisement, which I already mentioned, and which, is, which can be seen in electoral results in the region. Coming now to Appalachia or West Virginia in, in particular. Um, West Virginia has, has had a history fossil fuel country of the US uh, for, for over 100 years. And this If you go to West Virginia, you can see the glorious past of coal mining everywhere. And um, I think it is important to recognize this, but at the same time, my impression is that in the, in the discourse, in the common discourse, it is sometimes overrepresented, this, this strong coal identity. Um, in the 90s, or late 80s, early 90s, uh, was the first shock to, to the existing coal industry uh, when mountaintop removal uh, became the common practice. So already in the 1990s, a lot of miners actually lost their jobs and, um, and the number of jobs or number of people employed by the coal industry never recovered from them. The second shock, as I said before, came in the 2010s uh, with fracking um, or um, advances in fracking technology that um, decreased the price of natural gas and uh, also led to a shift away from coal production. So that is, I think, one very interesting thing in West Virginia that now the coal industry, while it is still an, an important economic sector, uh, it is actually supporting relatively few jobs. The numbers are somewhere between 13 and 20,000 jobs, direct jobs in the coal industry of a, in a state of 2 million people. Um, so these are still well-paid jobs, but uh, not, not the same, don't have the same impact anymore as they used to. On top of that uh, came the opioid crisis that really hit the state, a uh, state that also has a, has a large veteran population and, um, and, um, and many people who, who suffered injuries in, in coal mining and um, got addicted to opioids uh, in the aftermath of that. Um, so let's start with the failures in West Virginia because <laughs> they are more striking and um, 
more, more visible. So uh, if you if you drive through the periphery in West Virginia, you do see ghost towns of uh, former mining uh, settlements that have been abandoned. Um, the economic decline is very stark and uh, the development outcomes are very poor. Um, but I, I think it would be unfair to, to omit the successes. And um, some, some places um, are already on a good path, path to manage the transition. Um, in particular, the, the city of Morgantown in West Virginia is, I think, a good example how the focus on, on education and uh, increasingly healthcare can uh, demonstrate a way forward from, away from coal. Um, on a side note, here in the US, the city of Pittsburgh is usually uh, used as the poster child of a successful transition from, from coal to, to the service and health economy. Um, I would, I think it is obviously true, but I would be careful to, to draw too many conclusions from the Pittsburgh experience for, for smaller towns and, and yeah, more peripheral areas in, in West Virginia and Appalachia as a whole. So what were my findings? Well, what did I find during uh, my field work? Um, so and, uh, and I focus here on West Virginia because that's what I was here to study um, in a separate talk. Maybe we can talk about Eastern Germany. So one of the things is that um, very few initiatives really expand beyond administrative units. Uh, so you do have the ARC as an overarching um, uh, institution, but actually even um, collaboration between counties is really difficult and um, I'll, I'll come to the reasons later. Um, in general, and that is related, in Germany there is a higher hands-on um, involvement of the federal government and uh, I think on the one hand we, we do need to recognize the important position that uh, states have in the US. Um, but on the other hand, maybe it would be wise to um, also from local units to demand a higher technical involvement of the federal government here as well. Um, and that, that relates to, I think, one crucial problem that um, I, I discovered, um, the, the procedures to access funds, uh, mainly federal funds for regional development and uh, financing the transition um, are really difficult and there are very high barriers for local initiatives to actually access the funds. So many times when I talked to, to activists, they told me, well, it's not that there isn't enough money, but it is really hard to access that uh, money. Um, and if there are success stories uh, in the transition, they're usually driven by what I call anchor investors. I know that this, that this is probably not the, not the right term, but maybe someone from the audience can, can give me a hint what I would, should better call them. Um, so these can be um, wealthy local families that are really rooted in the region and want to see the region succeed or legacy industries that have uh, individually managed the transition and they need to develop the immediate environment to, for example, accessing uh, talent. So what you have, you already have some sort of structure that can manage the whole process of getting access to additional funds from outside. Um, let me briefly also talk about the cultural aspect that I that I mentioned. Um, so I, I think that the coal identity is a reality, but at the same time, it seems less important than uh, a, a general um, resistance to to outsiders coming in and and managing the transition for people. Um, what I I saw was really. Um, an entrepreneurial spirit uh, with many people who, who want to do their thing and uh, who would happily um, access funds on demand, but they resist this idea of a centrally uh, planned transition. Um, 
going on with that, or maybe a reason for that, is that there's a high level of distrust in, in politics. And especially in West Virginia, I, I think that could be explained by a high degree of state capture by in the industrial interests, um, because the, the coal industry has been uh, basically making policies in, in politics in West Virginia for the past 100 years. It is really difficult to to disentangle what, what, what is a true bottom-up political demand and what is a political necessity for, for the industry. And then um, finally, with, with regard to that, I, I think it is a very interesting finding that um, the, this um, mixing between industry interests and state interests has led to, to a distrust in politics in West Virginia. But I think in Germany, the close collaboration between industry and, and state institutions actually made the, the transition more smooth and um, enabled this compromise. Um, so two sides of the same coin, and um, I'm, I'm not sure which one will prevail in the end. Um, or it is clear that in the US, uh, one side, the more state critical side pre has prevailed so far. And whereas in Germany, the involvement of the state is more accepted. So these are my findings. Now the, the big question, so what? Well, what do we do with this knowledge? Um, I, I think it is clear that um, yes, both regions are undergoing structural change away from coal and fossil fuels, and those regions have been hit hard by the change. And we need to recognize that. Um, I think what is crucial is investment in infrastructure, starting with uh, roads, internet, and um, public transit ideally even though I, I don't don't see that at this point in West Virginia and you you can already see that the investment in infrastructure in eastern Germany paid off uh, during COVID because during COVID a lot of people uh, left cities um, same here in the US um, but actually uh, the region south of Berlin around Cottbus benefited from, from that uh, city flight during COVID, whereas West Virginia did not benefit so much from it. Um, I think it is for, for both sides actually very important to support the entrepreneurial spirit uh, that is already within the population and um, structure the process uh, to access funds clearly and easily so that they can actually be accessed and um, teach people how to do it. Um, as they say, uh, if you teach a man to fish, he will uh, have, uh, have fish for the rest of his life. Um, and I think that ties in um, this, this little bit of uh, research, this study with my overall research agenda, um, the idea of what, what the impact of, of local um, decision making is on international politics. Uh, I think we can, in this case, really show that German American policy learning can move both both regions and both countries by uh, extension forward. Um, institutions like ALCGS or um, Pocasito or other initiatives that. Uh, that bring people together who have similar experiences but different expertises and learn from each other can be um, an instrument of, of soft power uh, for Germany in this particular case, I would argue, but also uh, they can raise the, the understanding for the US uh, in Germany and uh, subsequently, subsequently lead to a stronger transatlantic alliance. So. Those were my points. Um, I went a bit over time, but I'm really looking forward to your comments. And um, yes, please shoot away. Thank you. Well, Thomas, thank you so much. That was such an interesting presentation. Um, and I'm really excited to dive into questions. Just a reminder to the audience to please type your questions into the Q&A function. 
Um, but I'll take moderator's privilege and um, start us off. So in the United States right now, a big portion of President Biden's agenda, the Build Back Better initiative um, is trying to make its way through Congress and Senator Joe Manchin from West Virginia is one of the people who is blocking this legislation and a lot of his reasons have to do with the coal industry in, in West Virginia. So I was wondering what, a, a couple of things, you know, what, how is this playing out on the ground in West Virginia? Do people in the state, um, you know, are they resistant to this climate focused legislation? Do they want this big government um, intrusion into, into their, um, their infrastructure? Um, so how, how is that playing out with, you know, the markets, the industry, and just that culture of not wanting a federalized, um, centralized government telling people what to do? Great. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, um, I mean, it, it was really good timing on my part to be here uh, during these negotiations, um, and I found it fascinating to follow. Um, I, I think, yeah, Joe Manchin has, has been a puzzle to me. Um, to, to a certain degree, because my, my impression from, from the ground in, in West Virginia is that, that people would actually like to have that federal money. Um, and that there is also less resistance, that the people are open to becoming entrepreneurs in the solar industry or in the wind industry. Um, I, I have seen examples for that. Um, academically speaking, I, I can, I do recognize that that might be a case of selection bias, but um, there are these people. On, yeah, well, what puzzled me about Joe Manchin is that um, uh, I would think that bringing extra money to your state would be um, a good case for uh, re-election, but uh, he probably has, or his team probably has better insights. And I think one of the insights is, um, I assume um, that, you know, if, if you have a literacy rate of uh, below uh, 90%, um, you know, making college free is probably less of a, pro of a, of a pr priority than, than other things. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that is, um, that, that, that might be one of the reasons, but um, yeah, I hope that answered parts <laughs> of the question. <laughs> Thanks. And we have a question about your recommendations to make it easier to access US federal funds. And um, we're wondering, you know, who is this geared toward? Is it federal policymakers? Is it, you know, local advocates who can then, you know, communicate, provide grant writing assistance to those activists on the ground? Uh, b both. Yeah. Um, uh, I think, um, and I, I have seen, or only looked into detail at, at one um, re request for proposals for uh, structural federal money. And um, it seemed very bureaucratic, um, very, very, you know, uh, even this application would be a multi-stakeholder process, um, which, you know, on the one hand, one could argue that it is important to, to have many eyes looking over an application before money is handed out. But on the other hand, it also deters uh, many people or organizations to, um, to go through with the process. And while, you know, I, I think it would probably be more difficult to, to change that, that system of allocating funds, I think it is, you know, it should be first priority or the low hanging fruit uh, to to enable people to to actually go go through with that process, and you know there are good examples um, of um, entrepreneurship centers that that support entrepreneurs to to access uh, support funds, or also um, I I know that from Germany that there are organizations that that help civil society initiatives to help. Um, federal or European funding. And uh, I think that should be, you know, th that is a low hanging fruit that West Virginia, the West Virginia government um, or even the federal government could introduce on a 
relatively short schedule. And sort of on that same vein, this is more about like the local wealthy entrepreneurs who are helping to assist lo localities in their phase outs. Um, so did you find out about any specific workforce retraining um, projects that are financed in this way? Or what was the, what was the type of assistance that those, um, those local wealthy people were giving to their communities? So, uh, one example uh, of a family that, that, that is living um, outside of Charleston, West Virginia, um, is that they invested in, in cultural attractions and, um, first of all, cleaned up the street, um, which, you know, from a European point of view is, is quite difficult because um, they, they are essentially taking over um, local government functions. Um, but at the same point, if, if this the municipality is bankrupt. Um, it, it is a good first step to do that. And, and yes, there are initiatives also in collaboration with German organizations uh, to not only retrain people, but actually train people um, with the idea of the German uh, vocational training system in mind. Um, and I think there are um, good, good examples as well that um, I, I can uh, mention in detail in uh, the blog post that will appear soon. That also perfectly segues into another question. Um, so in addition to these, you know, German apprenticeship programs um, or German style apprenticeship programs are West Virginia stakeholders in contact with stakeholders, their counterparts in East Germany? Yes, there are several um, initiatives that are uh, being led um, by interested individuals. Um, one, I'm not sure if it's uh, an etiquette. I'm not going to say his name, but um, uh, there, there's one particular person who helped me a lot with my research, and uh, he's organizing um, exchange programs that are um, fu funded by, by institutions like uh, the DRD or um, that's more on the academic level, but also the German Marshall Fund has programs on that. I think AICGS is going to have a similar program next year uh, with the uh, regions in transition or uh, something like that. Yes, Social yeah. cohesion, yeah. I remember yeah, exactly. that. Um, exactly. And um, yeah, there, there's a network called Pocasito, uh, which is uh, working on this and also includes, which is America wide, but uh, also includes uh, stakeholders from West Virginia. So okay. a long way to say yes. <laughs> well, and I'm also wondering, is that is that just limited to East Germany? Or, you know, are there also programs like in the Ruhr region, for example? Um, precisely, I, I actually think and that that's one of the findings that I um, conveniently omitted in my presentation. Um, I, I think the case could be made that um, policy learning would be way more important from between West Virginia and, and West Germany, because actually the, the similarities are closer in a way that uh, the, the coal phase out was also um, economically driven in West Germany. And also the the process has been not entirely concluded, but is very advanced. So um, yes, uh, especially Pocasito does a lot uh, with West Germany as well. And uh, there is an is a mayor's initiative uh, that um, brings mayors together from, from these places. Okay, thanks. And that also answered my other question I had for you about why you chose East Germany versus mm -hmm. um, the examples in West Germany. Um, so we have a question from Eric Langenbacher, the AICGS uh, Society of Culture and Politics Director, and he says, so there are major differences in how Germans and Americans have responded to these structural changes, um, and it seems he, he thinks that you think that the German approach has been better, but you also mentioned that both regions have turned to the right. And what explains this common political shift if the policy environment experience of the transition has been different? Thank you, Eric, for this question. <laughs> um, 
so I, I think while this transition is important, it is not the only thing that is important and is not the all consuming topic for everyone. Um, I think there are also other things in place, um, in particular, the type of campaigning. Um, and in East Germany, which is probably similar to, to West Virginia, you know, there, there's, a, there's a long term feeling, not only feeling, but um, a story of neglect and um, by, by the federal government, by, by the established state institution. So I, my sense would be that that actually um, would be a more, more appropriate um, factor to explain uh, the shift to the right. Uh, nevertheless, the, the transition, even though it has been managed better in Germany, that, that plays a part in this, in this neglect. And um, I think in East Germany, one of the reasons that the Kohle Commission was so inclusive um, is to, to not further push, push the electorate to the, to the extreme right. And that, that being said, if I can just um, tell you one, one little anecdote. Um, so in, in Germany, in Eastern Germany in particular, since the 1990s, through the expansion of, um, of lignite open cast mines, uh, public consultations have been a very common um, social practice, so to say. And um, therefore, it was way, way easier also in terms of institutional learning to, to apply um, or to bring forward um, public consultations. Whereas in, in West Virginia, I just saw the ARC recently published their, uh, their, their work plan for the next five years, I think, and um, presented the, the participatory elements and in a region that, that stretches from Western Pennsylvania all the way to Kentucky, they asked or involved uh, roughly a, a thousand people in this process, which is good. But at the same time, in Eastern Germany, the context is that people expect to be asked about these things on a more regular level. Or, and um, I, I don't have the number, but maybe I should look that up for the soon to be published uh, essay. Um, how many people have been actually involved over the years in public consultations. My, my assumption would be that it's uh, an order of magnitude higher. So you, you mentioned in your talk that there had, despite all of this consultation, that there had been somewhat of an unjust transition in East Germany. Can you give us a little more detail on that? I mean, uh, the criticism, uh, firstly, the, the most stark criticism is that um, young people were not truly represented in the Kohle Commission. And therefore, the biggest chunk of money went to, to, the, to the coal mining companies and the, the um, coal power plant operators. I think that is the biggest and you know most visible criticism. Um, in in theory, uh, the, this money should also be distributed towards the workforce in one way or other. Um, but but that is just the band aid. Um, for 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 today's problems, uh, I think, and that is the criticism. The, the the way forward is still a bit murky, even though there are these ideas of um, establishing a tourism industry, establishing industry clusters, uh, and so on. Um, there are these ideas, but you know, ideas are plentiful, and um, in the end, what what counts is is the money in someone's pocket. And, um, and we will have to see how that plays out. Right now, the criticism is that, that the actual, the material benefit or the material compensation went to, to the people and organizations who were 
who are polluting now and who are in power now and that the future generations have been given a bunch of ideas as compensation. <laughs> All right, and um, your fellow DAAD fellow, mm -hmm. Kai Opperman, um, has submitted a question. Uh, he asks, given the differences in how the two regions have approached the phasing out, is there evidence about differences in public support or opposition to the process? Um, so is opposition stronger in West Virginia, um, or is there sort of an equal amount of opposition um, in these two regions that are trying to do a, a, a coal phase out? So I actually don't know that. That is a very good question. Um, my my intuition is that you can you can use um, electoral politics as a proxy for that, and given that um, in the last Bundestag elections, Eastern Germany voted less right than expected whereas West Virginia um, is going to the polls next year again. And, um, and we have seen in, in Virginia just a few weeks ago that there was a swing back to the right. Um, yeah, if you take that as a proxy, I, I would say that the, the support is mildly better in Germany uh, than it would be in West Virginia. Um, but that being said, I also think that while there is an official process in Germany, so far, there's no official process in West Virginia. And, and also no, no overarching strategy. So that needs to be developed with, you know, when, whenever it's clear how much money will be available from the Build Back Better initiative. And, and so yeah, the, the hope can only be for West Virginia that, that people, especially local decision makers, understand the opportunity they have in um, trying to access these funds and actually develop their communities. Speaking of Build Back Better, we have another question. Mm -hmm. um, back, to, back to Senator Manchin. Um, do you think, given the stress, the state stressed economic condition, that his concerns about inflationary and personal um, tax increases um, required to support the Build Back Better initiative are part of his assessment. Probably, as I said, uh, I, I'm not privileged to, to see his assessment. Um, I'm also not an economist, um, but that also makes commenting on economics easier. <laughs> um, so, I think, yes, that is probably a valid reason, but at the same time, I, it is hard for me to, to understand why, the, why it is acceptable uh, to have an 87% literacy rate and um, a human development index that is lower than some parts of Mexico. Um, and I lack the imagination uh to to upscale the the living situation uh without large investments um maybe there are other ways but um i i don't see it and at the same time a, a lot of money will be spent whether it's you know i don't know one trillion two trillion three trillion i i don't know you know and the some like a lot of money will be spent and the question is is the that is again a question of, of administrative capacity will west virginia be able to to funnel a significant amount or the necessary amount or you know a substantial amount of money into developing their state or will it be the more you know, uh, will it be administrations that maybe have more experience with this or who already have more uh, financial power to, to organize um, um, this, this uh, accessing the funding? I think that is the crucial question that I found um, accessing the funds is, is a big question.
Okay, and we have a question from Jeff Rathke. Uh, so he asks um, if you can say a bit more, and he doesn't know if this you looked mm -hmm. into this, um, if you looked at out migration away from Eastern Germany, away from West Virginia and its effects. And is there is there a difference in geographic mobility? And if you know that has played a factor in the range of options authorities have um, to to you know implement the coal phase out. So uh, I think there are two aspects to this question. One is the question of com commuting living, let's say, in the Lausitz and commute into Berlin, commute into Cottbus um, or, or further west or even for, further east towards Prague or um, even other countries, right? Where we are in the European Union uh, where you can just travel across borders when there is no pandemic, um, hopefully soon. <laughs> um, so the, I think, yes, this like uh, commutability is definitely at this point uh, higher in, in Eastern Germany also because, I mean, Jeff knows that everyone here knows that, but actually, I mean, Germany is geographically speaking a very small place compared to the US. Um, it, it took me six hours driving from the south of West Virginia to the north of West Virginia and that is roughly the time that it takes to drive from the south of Germany to the north of Germany. Um, ju just to see that context. Um, I think in West Virginia, and there was recently there was a, a story in the Washington Post about um, an obituary about this baseball player from West Virginia who passed away and I've, I'm blanking on his name right now. Um, I think that that was a very interesting story because I think the common narrative in West Virginia is you have to get out to make it. And that story was again reinforced with, with, this, um, with this obituary. Um, but what I have seen, especially in terms of um, veterans and former military personnel, is that, yeah, it is, it is true that uh, you have to get out of West Virginia to, you know, get a, get a start in life or, you know, whatever you want to call it. But then, uh, in, especially in that community, I think it is very common um, to, to return to West Virginia and then try to, to, build, to build something. Um, again, coming back to the entrepreneurial spirit that I mentioned. And... Um, Maybe it would be interesting uh, I might take a note of that, to see how the, how the US military, which is um, for better or for worse, um, a really, really strong institution. And it would be interesting to see how they encourage their veterans to you know, take up the initiative and what resources they um, support. Whereas in East Germany, again, a long, long winded answer. Um, in East Germany, I think there was a huge outward mig migration already starting in the 1990s. And that trend, I don't think even with uh, the recent moves towards, uh, you know, the, the Eastern, Germany, Eastern German periphery uh, due to COVID, I don't think that has been fully reversed. Um, especially in the more peripheral places. Um, um, I think that kind of answered the question. Okay. <laughs> uh, and so you you had mentioned in your talk about how there's this you know distrust of politics and this you don't really know what is grassroots and what is maybe an industry push um, mm -hmm. for, for certain regulations. And we have a question, um, if you considered the impact of corruption, um, and the use of funding on a larger scale, for example, recent reports about the West Virginia governor's ties to coal companies evading EPA regulations. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not an expert on corruption. Um, I think Industry and politics is very close and very intertwined in, uh, in West Virginia. Um, 
So some people might already call that corruption. Um, I, I don't know this particular case that you are referring to. Um, for me personally, I think if it's, it's a clear cut case, if it's criminal, uh, I don't know if that case is. Um, so if it's a criminal, criminal ne neglect, then, then yes, that is corruption and, and probably a re result of, of uh, state and industry working so closely together. Um, on, the other, on the other hand, I also think it is important that um, politicians understand both, not only the the bottom-up approach uh, of the electorate and what the electorate wants and needs, but also um, industry is important. And we, we should not, I, I would like to live in a, in a, in a world where we could um, make all decisions based on um, you know, uh, moral technocracy <laughs> or moral superiority, whatever. But um, the reality is that you have to take into, um, into consideration these interests as well. The degree of that, and you know, that, that can vary and it can be too much, even if it's not criminal yet. Um, and again, on the other side, I think in Germany, um, it has worked quite well in the sense that the, the state involvement has given the whole process a level of legitimacy that, um, that otherwise I don't think could have been achieved. Um, I, I, I would recommend the, the recent book by Evan Osnos on, um, on wild land, I think uh, about parts of it are take place in West Virginia and and there are some cases he or he describes a few cases where um, environmental regulations have been criminally neglected and um, I actually have not followed up what the what the court cases have led to but thank you for the link and also the question all right so that puts us to time um, so I want to thank you, Thomas, um, both for being at AICGS fellow. It's been a pleasure to have you and, and for your research. And um, throughout this webinar, we've mentioned his upcoming publication. His essay should be published um, next month if you'd like to read more. And um, also, I wanted to um, alert your attention to our events coming up this week. Tomorrow, we have a webinar on um, pro the prolifer pro proliferation of conspiracy theories. Um, in a transatlantic context. And on Thursday, we'll be having an event on healthcare and lessons learned from the pandemic. Uh, please also be on the lookout for invitations for the rest of our DAD um, fellowship cohort. Um, we'll be doing events in the upcoming two weeks. And I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. And thank you again to Thomas for your presentation.